as uh, Heidi said, I'm Tim Almaney with Secret of Washington Research Station. We are the environmental research uh, department within the museum. And just to make sure people know, the museum is not an agency. It is entirely a private nonprofit. And the research institute, our research station is, is, is a, a soft money institution. We depend on grants and contracts from you folks in order to, to stay alive. So we appreciate all those. Uh, and these are, of course, people who have funded us over the years and worked with uh, who have been, been around a long time, worked with most of you here in the office. So uh, I will cover really uh, a little bit of background about mining in general. And I'll go into a fair amount of detail about how SWAT actually works. A lot of that will apply also to another one primary a model like HSPS. So some of that I, I want to make sure that we pull the wool off of your eyes, make sure you see how these things would work. It's really look quite simple. Um, and then I'll go over some strengths and weaknesses and go through some of the case study uh, I've done on the St. Croix and, and, and the Sunrise. Um, okay. Let's see what this, maybe I need to point this at that. Uh, how do you ask us where we fit into the 10-year uh, cycle here? And we pretty clearly fit into the water resource and characterization part of the cycle. We can figure out how things work in the landscape and try to model those things. Um, I think we also fit into the restoration part as well when we start looking at DMPs, how much they can reduce the uh, uh, non-point loads of sediment nutrients. That's another place where SWAT gets involved as well, of course. Um, I'm going to, uh, a little bit of that, but we covered some of this, of course, most of you know these things. The model is going to be really just a simplification of a very complex system down to its essential components and processes. And we want to do that in order to, to, to be able to manipulate those things and understand things. Why model watersheds? Well, we're really going to talk about the two main reasons in the previous slide. One is to understand the watershed. Uh, and as we have all this data. We have all this monitoring data on flow, water quality, slopes, soils, land use. How do we put all those things into a coherent framework and understand how they fit together to really map and follow water across the landscape and how we end up with water quality at the, at the end of the at the end of the, the watershed and the receiving water? So a, a, a watershed model attempts to do those things and has tried to in, include everything that makes it difficult to do is trying to get to the essential components and processes. And the second reason we model is to see how that system behaves when you change conditions when you change land use, when you change climate, when you implement BMPs. So these are the two fundamental reasons why we bother the model. Um, and of course, you can't really do the second one unless you believe the first one. You've got to believe that the model is actually functioning more or less properly in order for you can uh, believe that the system behavior changes you're trying to model. Okay, the role of modeling and management, we, we've got the thin air cycle life. I put it together with just three little components. We have a monitoring component, um, for those of you who know Sean Schaller, that's Sean when he first started working with the research station in 97. Um, we uh, take that data when we think about it and we, we, we try to figure out what it means and do some modeling on it. And then we implement things to see how it changes things in the landscape. Um, and then we keep monitoring to see, make sure we understand what that, that implementation did. This is really a restatement of the scientific method where you gather data. You think about it, generate hypotheses, and if you're a good scientist, you don't have one hypothesis, but you have multiple hypotheses. You make sure you have other ways to explain things in the landscape and, and try to distinguish among those. And then you have experimentation that, that sees how these things work and fit together. You go through another round of data collection. And if you're a manager, you call this adaptive ecosystem management, which is really the same thing. Okay. Um, things to remember about models. Uh, I haven't heard people talk about you, but it, it, it is important to say models and re results are hypotheses. Uh, they are not data. They are giving you ideas about what could be on the landscape and what's going on. Uh, this is because models can be calibrated in multiple ways. They are non unique. Model scenarios can be run in different ways. They're non unique also. Um, my favorite quote is by George Fox, statistician at UW Madison. Essentially, model, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And you need to make the distinction between that. You're not trying to make things perfect. You're trying to get useful results. Model results are uncertain. We have this we have this continuum from being very uncertain to being very certain. Uh, there's, of course, one poll of, 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 the, of the public that would like to believe that all models are wrong. We don't have to believe them. Another one would like to say, well, they're not. They're, I just want you to tell me what to do. Tell me, you know, general, what the MPs are going to land people where I put them and what are the results going to be, and, and we're going to believe everything you say. And, and really, 
a good modeler and the rest of us in the world have to live in this gray uncertainty in between. That really is where reality lies. Um, background on SWAT. It was a, it's a Stanford Soil and Water Assessment Tool developed by Jeff Arnold, uh, a PhD thesis at, at Purdue in 92. Um, and Bernie Engels was part of this originated. He pieced together a lot of previously existing USDA models in order to make this work. Largely, initially, an agronomic model dealing with crop growth and, and, and the ongoing pollution from those crop growth things. He worked with uh, uh, Srina Boston, everyone calls him Srini. Uh, really, they were, uh, from the very early days, working together in Purdue. They're both now in Texas. Jeff is at Temple, the ARS, uh, ARS station there, and Srini is at Texas A&M. Um, but they have spent a lot, a lot of decades here working on this. Yeah. And it incorporates, like I say, previous modeling efforts by the USDA before they got involved. Um, it is a widely used model, nationally and internationally, one of the most widely used watershed models around. Uh, it has hundreds of publications every year and thousands of citations every year in the, in the peer review literature. Um, I, I monitor the international SWAT user group they, on a daily basis, and we get you know, dozens of questions come across. It's like I say, it's really a uh, widely used. You see there's a drop off in 2015. That's because the 2015 bar was only through June of 2015. It's really a, a half year in the winter. So uh, it, is, it is, again, a widely used model with a, a very a big user group. Um, background here, uh, spatial resolution, you can get small watersheds up to, to large bases. They have modeled all of Europe. They have modeled all of Africa. I don't know why, but they think huge models doesn't necessarily make sense, but people would try to apply SWAT at all scales. And they can interface down to the farm scale with something called APEX, agricultural policy extender or something like that, like one of their, one of their many acronyms. Um, temporal resolution is typically run on the daily time step. That's what I think mean, 95% of it's run it on. But it can run it on an hourly time step. Uh, and it can use green amp infiltration on that scale. So I have to use curve numbers. Curve numbers are the primary way most people use it. So it's typically a daily operation, but it can be used on an hourly basis. I've never done an hourly basis, so I can't really vouch for it on that, but, but I know people do use it for that, not that scale. Um, input data are all widely available pretty much on the web. It's really not hard to, to get the data. It's got a good GIS interface with RGIS, and it's recently added one with QGIS for those of us who live in a nonprofit world and have trouble keeping up with the, uh, the cost of RGIS. You know, people in the state agencies may not have to worry about that, but we do. And I guarantee you, people in Africa and India using this model you care a great deal about the cost of these things. So, QGS would be a, you know, a, a widely used product as well. Um, it has its own sensitivity calibration and uh, uncertainty uh, program called SWAT Cup. I'm not sure why they didn't call it. It's a sense of calibration and uncertainty program. We should have had an estimate, estimate and make it SWAT Cup because there's a sensitivity as well. They didn't ask me for the for my acronym. And that uh, gets you into understanding, you know, the variability of the model results and allows you to have a better idea about the, uh, well, just how how clear or clean your one answer is for your, your calibrated model. Um, so that's a useful tool to add on top of, of SWAT models in general. The example I give here is in the St. Croix River Basin. You all know that's a uh, National Scenic Riverway um, administered by the Park Service. As Ken Burns says, one of America's best ideas. Um, we, uh, the the, the St. Croix is a 20,000 square kilometer basin that uh, straddles the, the Lake Ridge landscape in the northern edge of Corn Belt. If you do that, you're just asking for problems. Um, the St. Croix, uh, Lake St. Croix, is a 40 kilometer uh, lower reach of uh, the St. Croix River. It is impounded by uh, where it enters with Mississippi, so it has the custom conditions there. It's been listed as impaired by eutrophication by excess phosphorus. In addition, I've been modeled the Sunrise River Basin as well as one of the tributaries. It has multiple impairments as well. All of these things are related to uh, land use of too much nutrients, for example, typically. Um, so the model, why do we, you know, why do they do the model? Well, obviously, for all the things we talked about before, we built the model to help understand the source and transport of phosphorus within the St. Croix, uh, funding originally from the Park Service to get this to one of the centennial grants. Um, and we were uh, funded to apply the model to try to understand which agricultural BMPs could 
potentially a race to go what was said in, in the TMD study that was done as part of the impairment of Lake St. Um, Croix. That funding came from French mitigation funds from the Stillwater Bridge that's going in there now. Um, the, but the reasoning that the ag DMPs could reduce phosphorus loads, perhaps, um, and help compensate for potential increased urbanization through the bridge. Um, the model construction, these are the data sets. Um, it takes topography, of course, um, and uh, especially it will take a flow network if you have it. I highly recommend doing that. Um, if I use Sean Bonner's flow network in that, because I can get a high density flow network as input, and I can burn that into my DEM, I can get water says it really matched up with, with where Sean said they are on the landscape. So SWAT will do the donation for you, but it will do it better if you give it a really good uh, uh, flow network to, to force it to, to delineate in the proper places. Uh, place the wetman who wants to know uh, soils. Uh, I will say we did Stasco for the St. Croix. Uh, that was less than optimal. I would never do that again. I've always used Sturgill at this point. At the time we built a model, the Sturgill interface wasn't quite as like it really worked quite well now. I was highly advocated using Sturgill instead. Um, point sources, weather stations. You can get weather stations uh, from the uh, SWAT website for the Concerned con United States uh, in like 1960 to 2010. Yeah. Uh, livestock, we need to know where, how much. Um, I'm responsible for the north being applied in the landscape. And of course, land use, we use the crop data layers from the USDA. Intersected five or six of those, you get crop rotation in the landscape. So I can come up with crop rotation, but I can find each pixel on this, on this map. Um, we discretized the sub basin into 419 sub basins. Um, so about uh, 18 square miles each. And it took 39 largest lakes. You can't see those on the, on the map. Um, uh, and I had these 10 points that are where I could check flows at, uh, as far as, far as the model calibration for hydrology. We focused on really uh, the St. Croix River and still water and the St. Croix Falls for flow. And Lake St. Croix is the lower, the lower, lower bits there. And uh, the water quality validation which came from the St. Croix station, which uh, Karen Jensen did. The, and lowest the UC flavor as well at that station. Um, okay, these are the most important slides in the talk. When we talk about water nature, you use a hydrologic response unit. This is the fundamental assumption that all lump plant models make. SWAT, HSPF, this is how things sort of work on the landscape. How do you see this landscape? Uh, SWAT can intersect slope classes. Point again over here. Oh. Soil types. so well just a second ago. Land cover, and then you inter overlay that with your sub-basin map and you get you cookie cutter these things out. You intersect all these these layers and you get each pixel then can be identified according to its slope, soil, land use, and who the sub-basin is. I call these pixels and that's on each or you have because they're going to be little bits that come together to form the hydrologic response in any sub-basin. Uh, so those are where it feels that those unique combinations all would have their own hydrologic response. Let's zoom in on one sub-basin and see what that looks like. Okay, so here's the, the one sub-basin in the, in the sort of western part of St. Croix Basin with a lake in it, again a lake. And each of the, you can see the, these, uh, these uh, interview atoms are scattered across the landscape. They are widely uh, un unaggregated, they are just distributed there. Um, and SWAT says that's too complicated. I can't handle that. I have to lump those things together. I'm going to lump the light units together and make an aggregated HRU hydrologic response unit. So this is the way SWAT looks at a subbasin and simplifies this aggregated and disaggregated map all the way over here and lumps all the units together and makes each HRU into basically a big field. Okay? So it's going to treat that. That's how it's going to calculate the the rainfall runoff process is on that, that large, uniformly sloping unit of uniform land use, soils, and slope at that point. Um, so that's the, the, the deal with the double these lump parameter models make. And the question really is, you know, how, how well does this, does this, does this big field uh, approach, does it really represent the hydrologic process and all the disaggregated bits? Um, and it's another thing to realize that 
swamp does not follow the actual flow path of the water landscape. It follows the conceptual flow path of the landscape. It looks at the rainfall runoff process from here, follows it down the HRU, dumps it into a conceptual tributary, follows the overland flow there, dumps it into the reach, and then routes it down the reach itself. So that is the conceptual flow path, I think. That's quite different from the actual flow path on the landscape. We know the actual flow path on the landscape. Well, I guess I'll, I'll go into the main, main tenets here and get to the, the actual flow path in just a second. These are, this is the, the big assumptions that we have to make with these one parameter models. The first is that each HRU function hydrologically similarly to the disaggregated HRU atoms of which it is composed. That sounds like it's hard to believe, and it kind of is. Uh, it's not necessarily a terrible assumption, but we're going to say it's uh, okay for a while. And to the degree that it's not okay, we're saying the next deal we make is, okay, it's not perfect, but I can turn the knowledge of the model and compensate for the inaccuracies that step one imposed on the system. So we're hoping that those knobs are turned in the right way and that they are the right knobs to do that. So those are very important conceptual leaps we have to take and, and that's what the models make assumptions on. The third thing is that if we can really assume that those two things are right, then that makes each HR fundamentally independent of each other. I can process them independently computationally and then add up all the results at the end and dump it into the reach. And then route things down the reach. The reaches, of course, are, 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 are all linked. Uh, of course, the flow paths are not that simple in the landscape. The real flow paths are in, in, uh, impacted by things like depressions on the landscape. Uh, these clearly play a large role in non-point source pollution on the landscape. Uh, and because they are a low spot in the landscape, I mean, Swat would have treated a wetland just like another landscape unit, another HRU, as a source. Well, it, it's not just a source. It actually is it's not independent of the other HRU. It is something that actually receives runoff uh, and, 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 and other and, and groundwater from the surrounding HRU, so it's, it's not independent. To make up for that, Swat gives a couple tools that allows you to kind of kind of just apply this, and it allows you to put in a, a single pond or a single wetland in a subbasin that can collect a certain fraction of runoff and groundwater from the rest of that of that subbasin. So it's a way of getting around the idea that HRUs really aren't independent when they're loving and you can you can model them with, with these features. But you have to tell it what that fraction of the of the water yield from that subbasin is getting into each of those those ponds or wetlands in the landscape. Uh, and there's not a good tool for doing that quite yet. Um, this is, I, this is something I don't know how they deal with this, this issue. Um, but this does allow us a lot because you can have uh, 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 water quality processes going on in these depressions. You can settle out nutrients and, and sediment. And then, of course, the reach has its own water quality implications as well with erosion and deposition there. So, um, and, and with, with nutrient uh, uptake and, and loss. So there are those other features of modify water quality along the conceptual flow path. This allows us to, uh, well, this brings up all sorts of questions. How do we how do we parameterize these features? And that's difficult to say. We we need more data on the landscape to know how to how to parameterize what's going on in the ponds and the lakes and in channels. Uh, it gives us SWOT allows you then you can extract uh, data at different points, at different scales. Um, Sort of, you can't have a little plot scale, but these are the, a lot of the parameters in SWOT are based on plot scale studies. And there are tens of thousands of plot years data out there, uh, curve numbers and erosion coefficients. That's how SWOT gets its numbers. Uh, that's what it starts with. Um, you can extract the data at the upland scale before it's impacted by the lowlands. You can uh, look at it after it's impacted by the lowlands, what happens after it comes out of the subbasins and goes into the lakes, and then, of course, at the bottom of the watershed, what's coming out of the state of the after lake. At the bottom of your watershed, or at any point of the watershed, at any point of the 419 uh, subbasins we have. Um, so that allows you to deal with some of the scale issues, what's going on at different scales in the model. Uh, model calibration is, of course, trying to match uh, model output uh, to the data that we have to the degree possible. And by data, we usually talk about hard data, which are things like flow data we've measured, or monitoring or monitoring data that we've estimated most. Lows are not actually observed, really observed flows and concentrations. Lows are a model result from another model, but we have to trust those. We generally call them hard data. 
a soft data is something I'll, I'll get into in just a second because it's, it's useful uh, data from other from the literature basically. And to the degree possible, uh, I won't talk about it because Mr. Fit Measures Bruce Wilson did a little bit yesterday, but it, 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 we do our best to get a good number. We use that checklist. It varies. We want it to be above 0.5 and up to, up to 1. 1 is the maximum. It's like an R squared. It is a, a, a cultural determination. So uh, it does measure the variance measured by the model relative to, to the mean. Um, this can data, data types. Hard data, like I say, is data we measure. Soft data are things you get from the literature, and they really are using common sense to make sure your model results make sense. Uh, you have to look at different scales, different points along the flow path to see whether the, your model is doing what you think it is and whether you believe it. Um, and it's important because in the model X, Y, we just see it, you have hundreds of parameters that could change. Maybe even thousands. I haven't added up all the parameters in the uh, And you have a couple of data points you're trying to match. So you have way, way more many parameters than you do data points. You have more things you can change than you have constraints. And so it's good to use as many constraints as you can possibly get beyond the hard data, and that can be soft data considerations. And that's, you know, we, if, if my lake trapping enough phosphorus or sediment, does it make sense that it's doing these things in the well? So I try to check those factors as well, rather than just turning the off to match to match the, the, the one data point where I have more quality information. Um, these are just to show you some of the, the, the Everybody showed these plots where the, 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 plots, the, the, the model results versus the monitor uh, results. This is flow at St. Croix Falls. The exact cut are, are, are pretty good. The observed data are the uh, thick gray line in the background. The model data is the, the thin black line superimposed on top of that. Those are monthly values. We also look at the apple. This is the worst that I got in the basin of those, that it was 10 uh, points. Sediment. Uh, a little tougher to come model, but we got pretty good calibration results from the 2000s. The validation results for the 90s aren't as good. I think they're still acceptable when you don't have large stinks to match these. Uh, goodness to fit measures are difficult to get good numbers. The, the, the mean, mean is not so bad in those cases, so even as a 0.24, it really is not that bad of a tip. Um, I just talked about that. Um, let's look at phosphorus and how we kind of tweak that. This is the hard data I tried to get. This is these loads of phosphorus that coming into the Lake St. Croix still water. And uh, I'm, that, that's the target. I'm trying to make the model match that, that thick orange line there. And we're going to modify the source and transport factors in the water. So we're trying to match that, that measured phosphorus load. So sources are going to be land uses. And I want to make sure my land uses are getting reasonable yields. Transport factors are, of course, all the stream networks that carry things from the field all the way down to Lake St. Croix. How do I tweak those in order to also uh, match that total that total that we're getting down there still are? Um, my first step is to calibrate hydrology and sediment. Then that gives me the raw inputs. And then I say, well, what's going on with phosphorus? And I realize, oh, my phosphorus is terrible. I've got way too much. I've got more, I'm more than a factor of two too much phosphorus. And the question is, how do I bring that total down? Uh, my black line is the model results. It's much higher than the, than the orange monitored results. I can either reduce source strengths or I can increase trapping along the way. And I don't know what the balance of those are. The right answer is it's an answer of a combination of both in this case. So I started out by reducing these the questions do I reduce how much do I reduce these sources of nature use versus increase trapping in, in all of these components of the conceptual pathway down down gradient. Um, I started by adjusting the sources. I reduced the uh, yields from each of these crop types so they matched uh, what I thought were reasonable values between one and two kilograms per hectare per, per year. Um, that lowered load by about half. It was a useful step. Didn't get me down to where I wanted to be. Uh, next thing I did was turned on traffic in the, in the lowlands, in the wetlands, the, these ponds and wetland features. That uh, trapped uh, another, um, another, I guess, 10% more or less, 7% more like that. Um, still got 40% too much load. I still need to trap more. I turned on trapping in the lakes. That got up quite a bit more. Uh, and here I made sure the trapping efficiency was was what matched literature values reasonably well. Uh, Forty-five percent was the, what I was aiming for, and the, and the lakes went from ten to seventy-six, but average forty-eight percent. Uh, and I developed a little equation to help me 
10 grand years later, except my usual sort of model studies. Um, I still had two much to on channel processes, which allowed me to blunt some of the peaks and to raise up to low flow levels. There was a storage in the channel to allow things to absorb the larger peaks and then meter it out more slowly during low flow periods. And then, I think my next stuff just jumped up to something that was quite acceptable, 0.73. So, those are the steps I went through to, to model phosphorus in the basin. I mean, we human should basically go to model calibrate hydrology and sediments, adjusted the sources, adjusted traffic by the lowlands, adjusted traffic by lakes, and then modified the channel processes to bring it home. So, those are the steps I went through. And I think those are, those are valuable steps to try to take, but it just shows you that each step along the way is perilous. You can make a mistake at each of these steps. And we don't really know. There are things we don't know. We don't really know what traffic efficiencies are in these ponds and levels. We don't have the traffic acting information that I know of that knows what phosphorus accumulation rates in these bodies are. We know more about lakes. In our office, there's a lot of lake studies here. So we have a lot more information about that. But each of these steps, we, we could use a lot more data. We, this is pretty much guesswork on a lot of these large model computations. So um, I don't want you to feel that model results, our numbers are hypotheses. They're there and they are following the realm of uncertainty quite, quite large. Uh, I, nitrogen came out of the model as well. I didn't spend much time trying to calibrate it. The name platforms were, were acceptable, but I don't know that I necessarily believe this. It's, uh, uh, I think it is, as Mark had mentioned before, we, in, in this discussion, speciation in some of these uh, nutrients is, is, is a difficult thing in these models. Uh, this is with total nitrogen. The nitrate didn't look really quite good at all. So I, if I were to work on the nitrogen cycle, I'd probably to bring it into compliance, but I mean, this, this is just a, a, a looking model here, I think. Um, of course, you get maps about in which of these sub basins are the largest sources. Um, these are, and it's no surprise, they're the largest source of the phosphorus, or where there's agriculture and rivers organization. Uh, and the payoff then is trying to apply DMPs to see how much we can reduce these loads. Um, in, in, this, in the St. Croix Slot model, I look at no-till agriculture, vegetated filter strips, uh, grass waterways. Slot has modules for each of these, these sort of, of, of DMPs. Uh, I also looked at reducing soil test phosphorus levels. I can do that initially in the model. Um, I can apply fall cover crops, but this is, uh, I, I don't know who's done that in Slot before. I just simply did it by killing the corn crop and planting planting winter wheat and, and the model gave large reductions no surprise instead of phosphorus. Um, and soil health a little bit there. I, 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 there's not much, uh, as far as I know, I don't know who's done it out in the squad. I did it just simply by doing fall cover crop and no tillage, which has a lot of, which I'm presuming that it's carbon in the soil and it's increasing the available water capacity of soil as a consequence. So it's kind of a, an add-on to fall cover crop scenario. So in slot, when you do one of these things, remember we're doing this on an, H, on an HRU. An HRU is this big field that simplifies the flow path of, of water in the landscape. So it's doing a filter strip on an HRU by putting it along the bottom part of the HRU and mechanistically trying to understand what, how much of that's filtered by the, by the, the, by the, the overall flow. It allows you to specify what branch in the field is so far beyond the filter strip that it never really interacts with the filter strip. It bypasses it in concentrated flow channels. So you can, you can modify how the filter strip works, okay? And um, grass and water is the same way. That it's getting, it, it's acting like a filter strip laterally for both sides, and then it's, it's calculating sediment dropping out as the flow goes longitudinally down that channel. It'll calculate the velocity and the sediment transport capacity, drop out sediment whenever it's concentration exceeds sediment transport capacity. So it tries to do it mechanistically, but it's constrained by the simple geometry of the simplified way of the flow path is looking at. So it's, it's, it's a good thing to do, but it's not the same thing as implementing these things on the disaggregated HRU atoms that really compose these big unified fields. Um, when you talk about getting results out of the or the squad to look at whether the, uh, how, how good of a job you're doing, you're doing I pull it out at the upland scale, so I want to see what the HRU is doing or what the BMP is doing. It's more or less the field scale, field edge of field, edge of field being edge of HRU in this case. Uh, but if I'm not getting mixed and cool, I have to look all the way down here. 
at the, at the bottom part of the watershed to see how the transport has changed what's going on in the fields by the time it gets all the way down to Lake St. Croix, uh, miles away. So those two scales are the two that I look at most of when I look at the effect of the MPs. I'm not going to go into detail about all these either, just the, the bar plots, the that show the reductions in that the corn soybean location in yellow with the corn alfalfa or purple. These don't change because they are undeveloped ur uh, urban and, and, and grasslands. They're not being affected by any of the disease. So you can, you can get some reductions. They're large at the HRU scale. You have, if you have full implementation of cover crops, if you replace corn with grassland basically from you know, September through April, you're going to get large reductions in sediment nutrients. Nobody should be surprised at that. I don't know how people, you know, implementation is, but that's what the model will tell you, we get the large, large reduction over half. It's a very, it's, a, it's the most extreme case here, uh, at, the, at the upland scale. That, trans, uh, that translates down to lesser reductions at the watershed scale. This is the critical one we're looking at for the TMDL and the St. Croix. So getting in the Lake St. Croix, the maximum we got was about a 26% reduction as opposed to over 50%. At the, at the upland scale. So there's a, that's a, a, a useful, I think a very useful thing to understand in, in these models. But, you know, it gives you a feeling that, well, you can do all kinds of good things in the upland, and you should. But you but the, the effect that Lake St. Croix may be muted, and you can't expect it to be as, as large as it might, might have hoped. And, and this does nothing to deal with delays in response in the lake to change the nutrient load to the external loads. There's still internal loading going on. And that can have some inertia that, that, that will delay the response. So, um, all of the things to, to learn um, and, and to think about. And I think SWAT has a, a, a useful heuristic tool and useful mechanism to, to, to teach us about how the, the how scale changes the impact of your BMP you know, implementation. Um, now, how does phosphorus yield change with scale? And at this point, you know, why should I care? Well, because phosphorus yields at different scales. Phosphorus yield really the same thing as an export coefficient. We want to know how much kilograms of phosphorus per hectare per year is coming up the landscape. And we would like to know that at different scales because it's applied a lot. People want to know the common thing to take. Well, we have agricultural landscape corn crop is going to assume that we're producing this much phosphorus. How much of that phosphorus is actually getting into the water body that you're concerned about? And that, that scale matters because it, 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 there's, there's a lot of uh, modification on the flow path in between the field and your, your water body. Uh, for the St. Croix, it was uh, a good exercise to do. John Irvin did this. Uh, we took the, uh, when he wrote the TMDL uh, document, we looked at the land use in, in the St. Croix. You know how many kilo, how many square kilometers there are of each of these land uses. And you can apply then an export coefficient to each of those land uses to get a total load. In this case, we knew the total load. We had a good idea what that was. John's job was to was to apportion those uh, export coefficients so we got a reasonable estimate from each land use and where it came from on the landscape. So these these export coefficients, I think, are are better than most because they were finely tuned to the watershed we had at that at that point and at that scale. So at that watershed scale, these are these are good estimates of what the export coefficients are for phosphorus. I I did a model to summarize. Oops, I said, but they're not constant everywhere, and we can't change. How do we change the scale? Okay, and we know you change the scale because what goes on on a field, you might have five kilograms per hectare of phosphorus being produced. There are things that go on on the field that can trap some of that phosphorus before it gets off. Some of it gets trapped, perhaps over in flow channels as it leaves the field. Some of more gets trapped as it goes through wetlands and ponds before it gets into the reefs. Some more gets trapped at the at the subbasin scale as it goes down the channel there, and even more gets trapped at the watershed scale uh, as it enters lakes farther down the watershed. So at each point, you're losing some of that phosphorus or sediment that was generated in that field. And so how much you ascribe to that field depends on the scale you're trying to apply a result. Uh, let's see, so let's continue to be this. And so I can help with that, as I say, we can extract data out of the different at the difference of scale, the upland field scale, or the sub-basin scale, or the watershed scale. And I did this exercise for the Sunrise, which is one of the tributaries. I pulled out all the HRUs at the different, at the different land use types, cropland, grassland, and urban. I focused on the cropland here. And you can see the, the bars show the standard deviations. There's a lot of variability around these numbers. The dots are just the means of these bars. 
So I know the, the uh, sort of the average area of each HRU, and I know the average uh, phosphorus yield from each of those HRUs. Those are the, the dots that are funded for cropland, uh, urban, and grasslands. I can expect that at the sub-basin scale as well, so the area that changes there are the different sizes of the sub-basins, which is the different yields of these, of these land use types within the sub-basins. I had it at the watershed scale. I only did it for the sunrise, so only at the end of the morning for that time. And we had it for the full St. Croix based on, on what John had done in the, in the St. Croix team. The so these three points here are consistent internally within the swap model for the sunrise. This last point was uh, estimated independently, but it lines up pretty well with where, where it goes. And I just ran a, a line through those cropland uh, yields and to get this nice power relationship if you want to uh, see well, if you want to know what the export coefficient ought to be based on the watershed area you're dealing with, this would be a, a tool to do that. This should be done, of course, for a couple of St. Croix. So you have a lot more dots on here. And the St. Croix topography may not be representative of your watershed. So your export coefficients change differently with scale depending on on, on really the geomorphology of watershed. Things north of the glacial boundary are a lot more prompt and have a lot more complications than both that. And the things south of the glacial boundary where range patterns are better developed. Okay, strengths and weaknesses. How are we doing here? Have I got uh, we got plenty of time. We're gonna do do, do well. Okay, good. Um the strength part, I think it's got uh, a good GIS interface, and as I mentioned, QGIS is now available as a team SWAT, so that will open the model up to, to the impecunious of us. I don't think we need that, that help. Um, it, it has SWAT cup to help with calibration sensitivity. Um, input data sets are widely available. This is used all over the United States, all over the world, um, and it's, it's, uh, it worked a lot to try to make that user friendly. And it can be applied over a wide variety of scales. When you want to get a small scale, you can go down to this agricultural policy extender with the apex model. I haven't done that, so I don't know how smooth that operation is. I think squash drill strength is it, is it originated as a high as an agronomic model to begin with. Its strengths are to know what crop growth is, how to put crop rotations on the landscape, all the implementation operations, you can schedule these things, you know, down to the day or to the heat unit. Uh, so you can put in pretty detailed agricultural rotations as necessary. It's not a, it's not an average. It's just, you can put in corn this year, soybeans next year, change the planting base. Uh, it's, it's very good at that. Um, it has, I think, reasonably good drain trail uh, routines. They they were very simple to start with, but colleagues who use it now say they, they look pretty good. They incorporate the drain log model, so it's fairly mechanistic. It's not just you know using the simulated things just shallow flow. So it's, I think I think that should be uh, fairly usable now even at the HRU scale. Uh, I haven't used it so that's one reason I, I hesitate because I know this part. If I don't use things I have a little problem knowing like how how well it works. Um, it is reasonably good BMP routines. I've not had trouble with them. It seems like I get reasonable results back when I use the the fish filter strip and the grass waterway things and uh, the routines that I am not not unhappy with those. They're not, they're not getting any surprising results, I guess. That's as much as I can say. They haven't been validated. I don't know how well they've been validated against uh, real world situations. Um, it has a very large support community. Um, there is this lot mod flow linkage now. Um, Ryan Bailey out of Colorado State uh, has done this within the last year. He's a very bright young man, very motivated, and sure he'll continue this. The Koreans did this about 10 years ago. And it kind of fell off the radar screen. I'm not sure quite what happened in their version, but I think now that we have it in, in USA, a version with somebody who's uh, an up and coming research, I think it'll be maintained. And that should be a, a very useful uh, combination. Um, one of the strengths is that SWAT is constantly evolving. It's always bringing in new tools. It's changing a lot. They're trying to bring in uh, uh, any new DMPs when they can. Uh, urban routines are being implemented now. They're changing. Some of the topographic runoff routines, uh, all these things are, are good tools in development. In terms of weaknesses, one of the weaknesses is that SWAT is constantly evolving. And that's a weakness because, you know, it, it seems like it's always in beta development. I mean, and if there are times when I pulled my hair out many times running the model, they, they come up with a new executable and suddenly things have changed. Suddenly my model is no longer calibrated. So, 
they can use a little work with version control, and they are getting that. Their, their quality control is improving. They are they, they have done in the last three years. I say they've really stepped up the pace. I'm trying to make sure that their their executables are are consistent and uh, they know where the bugs are. Because bugs do come into this thing, even when they shouldn't. Um, and it's interesting when our quality routines are pretty simple to use something called quality routine. It's been around a long time. It's a linear stream of water quality model. So um, that can be improved. I went to a seminar symposium last year uh, dealing with Lake, Lake Erie, and one of the consensus was we should pour over the HST as a team as a SWAT. I don't know when or how that's going to happen. Uh, feelings were that that's where, that's where SWAT really uh, could use some help. Um, I think that Lake and Seven. Processing this is simple. It's not so sure what I would change in it now, but it could be improved. There are changes in the surface hydrology that, that could be done, and how it especially how it inter interacts with the wetlands. I think that needs to be fixed. But it has the same limitations as any love plan or model. You simplify the landscape in the DHR. You use these large units that you you assume work as well as the discharging units, and that's a, I could say that's, a, that's an assumption you have to make that. That other model, the rich space, like the negation model, doesn't have to make that assumption if it really works on a fine scale, fine grained landscape. Uh, so those are kind of a useful interaction between something like H and SWAT. You just be a, to use a gridded model to help inform these more parameter models because they, they can use it. Um, improvements needed. I would love to see better wetland parameterization area. We've been working on a project with Steve Floyd where we can use the the initial wetlands inventory to improve this data set to make sure we can get model ready inputs out of those those available data sets. So we know what wetland storage is, what the accumulation areas are, how much of the landscape actually is, is conditioned by these wetlands. So these are things I'd like to see improved. Better see more water quality routines. There are grain size specific transport routines in there. I haven't used them uh, and, and until I do want to remain skeptical, but they're out there. They have three or four routines in this block to deal with. Uh, six or seven grade size, even though we're probably sticking with the standard three stands on the clay. Um, and, and I think the forage routines need to be improved. People have more because they don't really need it. It's really crop based and they're looking at ag BMPs. And I think that's given the forestry part of the of SWAT, the short trip, uh, I think we need to make sure that woody growth is, is really uh, modeled correctly in the, in the model. I would like to apply this model to the forested areas. And until I do so, I get on the schedule. So, so I guess at that point, uh, we'll the questions. We'll take the camera and, and hand, it, hand it over to the, the audience. If any of you are out there who, who want to be asked questions, there's only one guy out there who's going to raise his hand. The kids all hate him because he's 